perhaps she would never give up the possibility of political hope. He's interested in the, the conjunctural possibilities that emerge, you know, even in the most dire situations. Gramsci at Sea is a succinct book that reads Antonio Gramsci's writings on the sea, focused on his prison notes on waves of imperial power in the interwar oceans of his time. Author Sherrod Chari argues that the imprisoned militant's method is oceanic in form and that this oceanic Marxism can attend to oceanic crisis, to the royal of sociocultural dynamics, to waves of imperial power, and to the capacity of black, Drexian, and other forms of oceanic critique to storm us on different shores. Here the author is joined in conversation with Sharn Lavery, Melissa Marshka, and Felipe Lebillon. Hi! We're all here to discuss Sharon Chari's Gramsci at Sea, and I think we're all going to introduce ourselves. My name is Sean Lavery, and I am a senior lecturer in English literature at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And I have known Sharad for almost 10 years. I'm Melissa Marshka. I'm at the University of Ottawa. I'm a professor in development studies. Delighted to be here and have known Sharad for four months now. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Phil Plebillon. I'm a professor at the University of uh, British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And um, I've been in contact with Sharad a lot uh, earlier this year. And before that, we, ha we had met, uh, I would say, about seven years ago. So it's a pleasure to be back. Thank you all. And I'm uh, Sharon Chari. I'm the author of Gramsci at Sea. And it's an incredible privilege to be in conversation with Sean, Melissa, and Philippe also because they are so invested in the various aspects of the, the material this book engages. We have also been, all of us, fellows at the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies this past year, which is where three of us are, and one of us is in his heart. So, lovely to be in conversation with all of you. So, Sherrod, you have finished this book. It's about to come out. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to write the book? And another way of saying that is, I kind of wanted to know uh, a bit about what is Gramsci to you, uh, or who is Gramsci to you, and also, for that matter, the sea. Those are three big questions, <laughs> and they're also they're at the heart of it. Thanks for that. Okay, so I came to write this book I was asked to do a set of lectures at the University of Bologna, which were in a summer school on the sea last year, Northern Hemisphere summer. I did a set of lectures on Gramsci and oceanic extraction. And that was the impetus for writing this short book for Forerunners. And Forerunners was the ideal place to get it out in the world quickly. It builds on the two things you just mentioned, why Gramsci is interesting to me and to many people, what's interesting about Gramsci, and what we're all in different ways puzzling over how to grasp and grapple with the many dimensions of the oceanic crisis, which is also the planetary crisis, or a window into the planetary crisis. So Gramsci stands for the hope of bringing together materialist analysis and cultural critique in a synthetic way. That's one key reason that um, people have time and again gone to Gramsci, read Gramsci again. Another thing that I always think about in Gramsci is that Gramsci, as a Marxist, always is reading Marx and is always attentive to the practice of reading and rereading Marx. And there's something else that I stumbled into. There's been a major shift in Gramsci studies over the last few decades, which is of reading Gramsci, as he says, philologically, reading along his notes and reading along themes in the notes. And I just stumbled into, well, I searched for the, now that we can search for things online, I searched for his notes on the sea. And I also imagined that had he been in our writing today, his notes would have been hyperlinked and he would think of this as a kind of sea of notes. So they are kind of bizarrely interlinked. But his notes on maritime matters are really interesting, and they recast his own thought in all sorts of ways. They take him out of a nation-centric box. They take him into thinking about overlapping and intersecting empires, which is a theme in his work. He's just sort of a very much of a recursive thinker. He's about all about how the past is revived in the present. These elements, I think, come together in what I think is an oceanic method in his thought, and I think that becomes apparent through his notes on the sea. 
Should we uh, say anything more about Gramsci before we get into the C, maybe? Yeah, so I understand the C more than I understand Gramsci. And so I found your book absolutely fascinating to read because I the C part, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yes. I was stepping back to think about what Gramsci meant. And so I'd love to know about what Gramsci means to you and then thinking about his um, oceanic metaphors and writing. Yeah, so back to the notes on this. There are particular notes that are headed, you know, the, the, the headings of the notes give you a clue about how he thought they might be read. And there's one ex really exciting note about the emergence of uh, Pax Americana, you know, the U.S. imperial power in you know, his writing in the fascist prison in the 30s and 40s and imagining this sort of shifting imperial fortunes in that moment. And he's already been thinking about what's landed him in this prison, and he's thinking about waves of revolutions and counter-revolutions, interconnected waves of revolutions and counter-revolutions from the French Revolution to the formation of Italy to the kind of end of the possibility of a progressive nationalist project to the rise of Mussolini, none with any inevitability. And I said, you know, these are kind of like waves, and they are like waves in his thought. He says early on that when we think of a thinker, we should pay attention to their leitmotifs, their forms of thought. Again, a very humanities kind of way of thinking, you know, that we, we should think about the form of thought. As social scientists, we tend to kind of think of Gramsci as a thinker about certain concepts, but his forms of thought are really interesting. And that's what I'm turning to. There's a note on method where he says, this is how we could think about, we want to get away from a kind of structuralist Marxism, where there's a kind of stratigraphy, a kind of materialist base somewhere under, underground and cultural political stuff on the surface. It's much more turgid, much more, you know, and I'm, I'm rolling my hands around as a, to kind of enact a metaphor of royal, of kind of turgid waters, something like that. It's much more liquid. That's what I think is possible. So there, there are these metaphors in his writing. He writes about things that are happening on the surface, waves on the surface and deep currents below. He's interesting in our moment around, okay, let's shift a little bit to thinking about the sea itself. Oceanic studies is oceanic. There's so many things that people think of in this broad field, which is what makes it exciting. It's also a place of real possibility and thinking synthetically about where we are and not in, in planetary terms. You know, the oceanic crisis is the planetary crisis. But from Gramsci, first of all, the first one point is that the method is much more turbulent in its way of thinking about political economy and cultural process, let's say, or representation. That's one aspect. It's something that, of course, people have always thought of about Grant and Grant but the Oceanic Notes, I think, take us closer to it. And also they take us closer to these cycles or currents of imperial process. And then in you know chapter two and three of the book, which chapter one is really about reading Gramsci, chapter two and three take us into the Oceanic question, Gramsci asks, how do we think about the plight of the Italian South? Maybe we think, you know, how do we think about the plight of the oceans? Something that all of you work on in different ways. And I bring into that one of the inspirations there, one of the citations there is to the agrarian questions, to the importance of thinking about the agrarian question as an approach to studying capitalism, imperialism, where nature and land matter and shape outcomes. And I think in analogously, I'm you know, trying to draw the insights of the agrarian question literature and something that Philippe, I wonder what you would think about that. But I, I do kind of say that this is where an, an oceanic approach to the agrarian question an Aquarian question that might be uh, more precise than some of the recent work on extractivism or the industry work on blue economy, certainly, but the activist work on extractivism. Yeah, that's right, Jared. I was wondering, a major effort at the moment is to repeople uh, the sea. The sea often is seen in many metaphors as being empty, as being this either big void, the waves, the currents. Those are uh, types of um, physical entities, uh, strong materiality. But the sociality of the sea and, you know, the relationship of people with the sea and the sea with people sometimes does not really appear. So in Gramsci's work, the one that you cite, at least the mariners make a little apparition. And also the relationship between the sea, the sea creatures, and what does that tell us about the diversity of life and the beauty of life, and particularly when he talks to his son. So maybe peopling <laughs> the sea uh, through uh, you know humans and non-humans. How do you see Gramsci uh, 
kind of engaging with that. That's right. Peopling, enlivening. Gramsci calls his materialism, he says he's interested in absolute earthliness of thought. That's something he says somewhere, which I think if we think, you know, with most of the planet, that's also thinking about the liveliness of the ocean as part of this, however we think of the oceanic question. And peopling is only part of the tip of the iceberg, as you noted just now. There is that element in the social history of the oceans around mariners, seafarers, mariners, Lineborn, Redeker's amazing book, The Many-Headed Hydra, and all the other texts that, you know, on oceanic fishing, and Melissa's been doing amazing work that is bringing the labor question in, in a fundamental way. I'm putting my hand up here because I, I really want you to talk about, um, you have this great quote in the book about pelagic imperialism and you start to unpack and you talk about the fact that the ocean further depleting is linked to this labor exploitation but also fisheries exploitation so i yes. wondered if you could talk a bit more about pelagic imperialism well i mean you're an expert on this topic in this book i draw on insights from quite a lot of work and i think that what you're citing is campling and colas as capitalism in the sea and there I mean, given Liam Campling's work and, and yours and the importance of bringing the fisheries industry into the, the frame, right? Often something that's uh, forgotten. Right? Well, yeah, I think labor is often not even included as part of readings of the oceanic, often labor, the work, that piece is often missing. So for me, that was really interesting that you were able to bring that in as you started thinking. And that makes sense because you're talking about Gramsci and there's a labor piece to what he does. And so to me, that was exciting to see how you've made these connections. Yeah, but I mean, what you've said, Melissa, in your work is, you know, actually we do think often about the tuna and less about the fishermen. On the one hand, there's been a move in, o in the oceanic studies to be thinking about the ocean as an environment, which I think in your book also, Sharad, you say the environmentalization of the ocean in this yes. time. But there's an important way in which the book, in addition to Melissa's work and in fact Philippe's work, yes. is bringing back people and labor and questions of justice into the question of the oceanic. Yes, I mean, I think that's right. I think that chapter three, actually, which is trying to refuse a kind of abstract notion of land, labor, and capital, and the dance of these three ghostly figures, well, the, of Monsieur Le Capital and Madame La Terre, that comes from Marx, and Marx in volume three of Capital critiquing the idea, the mainstream econom economists' idea that these abstractions dance around in the air. And of course, they are anchored in real struggles with real people and real animals and real environments. And that's the lively materiality that uh, Gramsci is invested in. And there's another aspect to that, which is that the social history of the oceans has focused to some degree on oceanic labor on the surface. And one of the questions is, how do we take this under the wa below the waterline? And that's been a, one of the questions that so some people have gone into deep sea divers and science, the scientists who go underwater and the, all that stuff, coral reefs and pearl diving, pearl diving and all these sorts of the peopled aspect of the undersea. Mm -hmm. And your questions in your own work has also been about going beyond the human eye, but to the depths that's, that are beyond our human experience, right? And but yeah. not beyond human imagination or politics. And that's consistent with what the attempt in that chapter three is to say, if there's something that we can learn from the critique of Eurocentrism, Occidentalism, in thinking beyond a terra-centric or even surface conception of a, you know, a peopled capitalism, a peopled imperialism and struggles in that level, what does it mean? For me, these are, this book opens questions rather than, you know, so this is, and this is questions that we're all invested in, but I... I think the, the liveliness of the sea and struggles over that liveliness are at the core of that. I, I have a question about this, which, yeah, yeah. which, which, which I'm going to also quote from the book, okay. um, which is that at a couple of places, both in the introduction to the book and in chapter three, you talk about an analogy between the northern or terrestrial self yes. as distinct from the southern or oceanic other. Yes. And another place in the book, you ask, how might we attend to terraqueous territorialities and structures of feeling without lapsing into a background terracentrism? Yes. A land sea binary is not unlike a west rest or self other binary distinction. And so, what the book seems to be doing is to be posing kind of a parallel between land, north, south, and sea, south, 
other and, and linking kind of the sea to the south. So I, I wanted to know if that's kind of what you were doing and maybe how this links to like the south of Italy slash the <laughs> southern hemisphere slash the global south. Yes. And so what's kind of southern about the oceanic? So it's interesting. Gramsci himself points out to his own childhood taunt about throwing the mainlanders into the sea, which is, we know right, that in Southern right, Africa right, too. Yeah. It's uh, it throw the settlers into the sea, which is a Southern anti-colonial position in, in Italy that he grew up with, but a kind of crude one that he then he sort of refines and transforms. This is his, his oceanic thought, his constant revision of his forms of thinking. And he has a much more subtle formulation later on, which is, the point is, is not simply redress of the South, or redress of the oceans. It's upending the work of the binary that has been part of waves of pelagic imperialism, waves of oceanic imperialism in general. So Fernando Cornel's critique in that beginning of that chapter, he tries to read ways in which the self-other west rest binary is mobilized in different attempts at a kind of anti-Eurocentric form of thought, which preserves that binary. And I kind of said, suggest that conversation between Marcus Redeker and, in, in some ways, Meg Samuelson's response to Marcus Redeker about the shark, yeah. which I thought was just amazing, her way of reading the Damien Hirst shark in relation to the sharks of the, of the slave trade. That constellation of ideas is opening up something, I think. Another question was a little bit about the digitalization of the ocean, the modelization of the ocean, the robotization of operation in the ocean. You know, what, what does that tell us also about this uh, idea of surplus population, of deep peopling again the sea, making this kind of abstraction of labor and people and, um, you know, preparing in, in a way the ocean to be uh, fully exploited, having, you know, levels of extractivism that become detached from the possibilities of social tr struggles, precisely because they are seen as an impediment, potentially. Even if, you know, the, the, the class of professionals employed at sea, as you know, there, there are many different ones, uh, you know, so, some are highly exploited, others have uh, amazing packages uh, in order to uh, perform their, their work. One of the things I find useful about thinking with Gramsci is that he, he's always attentive to how things come together in particular conjunctures, spatially and temporally. I don't attend to the digital ocean, that I should say that, I, and its effects. It is an important question. And it, is, it isn't something that I attend to adequately, but I, I do a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I do a little bit. But I, I guess this method would say we still have to look at the specific conjunctural situations in all these chapters, actually, I wouldn't, Gramsci wouldn't, like Gramsci at sea wouldn't make a blanket argument about what the digital ocean portends in some of the ways I think you have characterized just now. You know, Melissa's been working on, on seafarers trapped in forms of unfree labor and fishing boats who could use some connection to the digital ocean to, to convey, the, in fact, their roots as discernible through the, through the digitization of the ocean tell us where they've been how long they've been away. So there are lots of aspects. And Gramsci would say, where are the tools of struggle here? And I think your work is actually pointing to the political use of some aspects of the digital ocean, including you know, seafarers' uh, ability or not to communicate while at sea for long periods, stuck at sea under in miserable conditions. And I also think you actually might not talk about digitization as much as a tool of struggle, but you bring in ideas of struggle. So you have ideas from agrarian studies, you have ideas from racial capitalism, all to help unpack the oceanic and what's emerging at sea. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about how you draw on both agrarian studies and racial capitalism to help us better understand and puzzle through the oceanic and Gramsci. Thanks. That, that, that's something that I puzzle through in general. But here, I actually point to, in, the, in that second chapter, some work from the Grand Martins tradition that has been doing something that is consistent with the expectation in the, in the word racial capitalism, which is that prior forms of power, authority, inequality, 
through race and through other means, are imported into and conserved in the making of particular configurations of capitalism. And that's very much consistent with Gramsci's method. Gramsci is always, always interested in conjunctures where elements of the past persist and shape the present. And in a couple of texts that I point to, a wonderful work by Matt Schutzer uh, on mining in North India, uh, Gavin Capps in uh, South Africa. Anyway, that, that, that work that shows how prior social institutions are drawn into reconstitutions of agrarian capitalism. You know, and my question is, is, can we look at, for instance, the diversity of labor regimes that we just pointed to uh, earlier, you know, that persist, unfree labor still persists in all sorts of forms. The peopled ocean is, is incredibly differentiated. This is a question, I think, you know, the, the way I would bring the agrarian question into thinking about the peopled ocean in that way is to think about how these prior forms are part of you know, making this incredibly unequal people see. I think that's the general lesson of racial capitalism. And that's what the Black Studies work tends to think of more about consciousness and about representation. When the agrarian literature, I think, gets more into the material conditions and less into the cultural and, I, I, you know, representational side of it. We don't think as much about the present stream of. Can I actually bring, I think we can move recursively across the chapters. There's a, a meta method here where you're reading Gramsci as having this recursive and oceanic method yes. uh, in, in his own work, but also that's the way in which you're reading him in this book, I think. I mean, one of the things the book does, which I just wanted to mention is, you know, you mentioned that the, the, the field of oceanic studies is oceanic in size. Um, and one of the things the book does is kind of via the, this conjuncture of Gramsci and, and the oceanic is, is kind of map out the field. There's quite a lot of, of terrain mapping to say this is through this kind of micro window onto the field. Here is the, is the wider field out there. But I wanted to ask you in particular about questions of your method. And there's places in, in the book in which you flag your method. And one of it um, is as like dialogic or conversational. So you say... You know, what you want to achieve in the book is a conceptualization of the oceanic question adequate to the present with Gramsci as a proximal interlocutor. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a bit about that, like about using Gramsci as an interlocutor. So as, as a kind of conversationalist in, in your thinking through these questions and or the ways in which, as you were saying, you have actually quite a, you call it a humanities method, but it's a literary method. It's a kind of close reading of Gramscian texts, which then in chapter four becomes realized in a kind of close reading of artwork of both art, literature, Moby Dick, um, Ellen Gallagher, and, and the other artists and writers that you mentioned? Well, a lot of that is thanks to you, Sean, thanks oh. to the education that you have offered. Um, Gramsci lends himself to reading, as I said, because he himself is always, you know, he's stuck in a prison. He has a few passages from Marx, if he calls himself a Marxist, he has a few, but he keeps going back to them and rereading and reinterpreting and thinking with them. He does these seemingly kind of potted histories of the French Revolution, but then they're, they're meant to be ways of rereading and rethinking and revising. So he is an, invested in reading in a certain way. So when I think with him as an interlocutor, that's what I mean, is sort of thinking with that, the possibilities in that form of thought as a Marxist as well, you know, as a Marxist who's still convinced that we have to understand how capitalism works, but not in a mechanistic way, and always attentive to conjunctural possibilities and struggles, and the artists, and also re-reading -re Moby Dick uh, through a kind of black critical lens, which you also wish me to do by taking Pip seriously. <laughs> Pip who falls into the ocean somewhere near the Straits of Malacca and and we know from Sean's work actually that Pequod has moved through the the ocean as the ocean through the Indian Ocean and, and the Indian Ocean in particular the Indian yeah. Ocean as in its oceanic materiality seeing all these creatures and also the the whales giving birth and all that and then Pip falls in and sees something horrific and becomes the kind of crazed person who can see the truth. He is, in that sense, a, a kind of incredible figure to think with. And he's a crucial figure for Ellen Gallagher also, the artist you've got me to, to engage her work carefully. Catherine McKittrick is the other figure who reads um, Ellen Gallagher with Drexia and tries to think about this black aquafuturist work as a kind of different kind of critical archive. And the, one of the exciting things is that Drexia, this 
It's a long backstory. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long backstory that can be summarized as what? This band that is fiercely anti-commercial, or not band, the kind of DJs really who are fiercely anti-commercial, emerging from the ruins of Fort Fortis, Detroit. Uh, for, uh, so in the aftermath of Gramsci's reading of this particular space from a distance as an archetype of uh, American capitalism, which he doesn't read as racial capitalism, in fact, because he doesn't read the Negro question as it, which circulated around him in that time. In the aftermath of that, in the ruins of that, emerges this electronica duo who I think pick up the question <laughs> and they pick up the question through this notion of the storm. They, they think of their musical events as grasping conjunctural opportunities in various places and stoking them. In the That's the kind of political hope that I think connects back to Gramsci. If Gramsci is just as, you know, Philippe, you asked about when you asked about the digital ocean, Gramsci would never give up the possibility of political hope. He's interested in the, the conjunctural possibilities that emerge, you know, even in the most dire situation, sitting in Mussolini's prison. You know, there he is sitting in Mussolini's prison thinking about folklore as a, you know, the source of hope. He writes to his family in Sardinia to tell him to send him childhood folklore and story, you know, fairy tales and things like that to look for the seeds of hope, seeds of change. So we think similarly about the oceanic question when Drexia imagines a black undersea utopia and they create these storms, these events, of musical events that are unplanned and anti-commercial. There's something there that Drexia read with Gallagher, Pip, John O'Comfra, gives us a way of thinking about constellations of political hope. I think, of, or of political transformation in dire situations which we face all over the world and seen through the oceans. And so when we turn to thinking about struggles in the ocean, we tend to think sequentially about the origins of the strike and of the abolitionism and you know the movements against abolition across the world, the making of the global color line across the oceans. Also, the struggles over the ocean itself, the legal struggles around um, the deep sea the importance of third world lawyering in that domain. And at the end of that, are the struggles of, of all these moments ever over? I don't think we can ever say that. Melissa here is working on, on the ongoing struggles of unfree labor here in Cape Town. And the archives of, of oceanic struggle are never past. They're always with us. This is what I, you know, throw caution to the wind and say in the end. That there's always the possibility that they might come together in particular ways and in ways we can't yet anticipate. Talking about things we cannot anticipate, at the moment there's a lot of work being done to try to get some of the most intelligent creatures on the planet, citizens, to uh, speak and, uh, in a language that we can uh, un understand through tr translation. I'm just wondering what is the place of uh, non-humans in uh, reviving this this hope and maybe learning a little bit of the vernacular uh, and uh, the folkloric tales that, uh, you know, well, <laughs> well groups are exchanging. We know they are. We know they are telling stories to each other. You know, is that something that could open a form of hope uh, in the 21st century when, you know, we'll be able to talk to those uh, extraterrestrial <laughs> and oceanic creatures? We have to, right, in some way, imagine collective, for Gramsci, you know, the question is, how do we imagine the articulation of collective political will? And that has to be, to think about the oceanic crisis, it has to be human and non-human. Gramsci, and it has, if his materialism takes us into an, you know, an earthly form, whether that means uh, decoding the folklore of the, the whales. <laughs> whales. And I think there's space for thinking on this. What does it mean without anthropomorphism? Or centrism. Or centrism as morphism. <laughs> you do actually end the book with a reference to Pip, what he sees. It, he's sort of kind of floating at the sea surface and what Pip sees or experiences is a sense of this intense liveliness of the yes. sea beneath him. This intense, mysterious, multitudinous and very strange. You know, in some ways it may drive him mad. Yes. Um, or as you put it, um, Pip might be the Gramscian organic intellectual of the oceanic crisis as a result. So maybe it's a kind of informed sort of madness. In, in later on in the same paragraph, you say, Gramsci returns to the radical traditions of the shipwreck with Pip and political hope. Yes. And there's something quite tricky about thinking about the creatures who were trying to learn their language and how decimated their populations are already, along with the overfishing that 
even the fishermen that Melissa is working with are very much aware of that their own jobs are at risk because of the increasing lack of fish in the sea. So there's quite a lot of reasons to not to, to be thinking shipwreck as, a, <laughs> as opposed to hope. Yes, so yes. May, and maybe this is you know it's the, it's the note your your book ends on, but I wanted you to maybe just say a bit more about this, like how Gramsci helps us to think both shipwreck and hope at the same yes. time. Well, he got the, he had that uh, the famous line from Omar Hollande, what is it? Uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Mm. So you know you can work with the tragic mode, but tragedy doesn't foretell its. Uh, in fact, they're, they're, all the great writers of tragedy have been opening up the contradictions, right? Helping us think about Caliban or helping us think with these figures. Pip is like a like little hidden gem in Moby Dick, you're right. There's a lot of speculation about what this, you know, whether Pip was an enslaved young black cabin boy on the ship. But Captain Ahab, this kind of crazed Trump-like, whatever he is, kind of megalomaniac figure bent on taking the ship to its destruction in pursuit of the, whatever the white whale is meant to signify, the whole you know, bloody work on this. Pip is the figure, the only character he listens to after Pip falls into the ocean, the only person on the ship who's still a person, not quite a person, who has also crossed the human, non-human boundary in a way. You know, maybe he is the figure that also that Philippe you're pointing to, the, who can listen to the stories of the whales. We don't need to decode it, that that's that kind of figure. Empathy and not in a humanist way, in a kind of revolutionary way. That's the Gramscian organic intellectual that, that we might read in Pip. Akomfra is an interesting figure because his Vertigo Sea reads in multiple streams, melting ice, these figures, you know, like uh, Echiano gazing out at the melting ice, Echiano when he has been free, a freed slave now, beholding the Arctic, right? He goes on an Arctic expedition. Virginia Woolf and, you know, gazing out at the sea, I love that aspect and but you know trying to think intertextually but also beyond the text as we know it right because the, the environmental aspect of a comfort takes us back in a way to philippe's question how do we actually read the scale of destruction melissa you know fighting for justice for seafarers trapped on fishing ships paid a pittance working under conditions of incredible unfreedom Chasing fish that are being depleted, destroyed. destroyed, chasing a fishery in the process of destruction. And we should say fighting for Wi-Fi on boats. Fighting for <laughs> Wi-Fi. All the elements of the conjuncture matter, all the political battles matter, so that, that, that we, we can't find the kind of second coming in one place. That's also Gramscian, right? You find the political battles that fit in a particular... That's what I think the black aquafuturists help us think with, the sites of political hope. Yeah, I think it's a really lovely way to end the book, actually, is on that note of hope. It's quite inspirational, actually, to see how one might think about the future through Gramsci and your focus on Black aquafuturism really intrigued me. It was very original, actually. The first three chapters I understood much more, but the fourth chapter for me was more humanities read and... Um, maybe a bit of a, a leap out of the social scientist way yeah. of thinking. And I wanted to ask you um, a little bit more about how you managed, I mean, you talked about Sharon's inspiration, but how did you even think like that? Well, Gramsci himself, you know, before he goes, he's imprisoned. He's an activist and he's also a, a theater critic writing these uh, and merciless about Pirandello. We couldn't stand Pirandello because he's interested in, you know, the cultural terrain in which the possibility of, political change might be you know, articulated, that this question of caring for this oceanic crisis at all is crucial. And so I also say he would have joined us binging Netflix through the pandemic. <laughs> I like that point. <laughs> yeah, there's no low culture low enough, Gramsci. <laughs> <laughs> Can we return at the end to this idea that, which you propose, the idea that the Gramscian structure of thought is oceanic? You mentioned in the book, and there's a way in which the argument overlaps a lot with the argument that we could push back on a dialectical form of thought, which has an inherent progressivism by going back to Caribbean thought and particularly the notion of tidalectics. So back and forth, the recursiveness. And that is in part the way that you describe Gramsci's form of thought. 
you say this is important, this oceanic form of thought is important in shaping political will, which now, you know, through this conversation, I'm like, okay, that's important because it's optimism of the will. You yes. know, it's important to shape this optimistic political will, um, despite pessimistic intellectual uh, diagnosis. Yeah. yeah, diagnosis. Um, but so maybe to think a little bit about the relationship to, to, between oceanic and tidal ethics and also the relationship in the book between what you're thinking of, of as an oceanic form of thought and what could also just be considered a fluidity or a kind of more generally. Yeah, I, thanks. That's a great question. I actually read Brathwaite's tidal ethics. I don't do it properly here, but I don't think what Brathwaite calls tidal ethics need be a critique of all forms of dialectical thought. Mm -hmm. And Gramsci is a dialectical thinker to the extent that he's interested in flux, transformation, change, struggle. Dialectics does not have to be thesis antithesis, that form. I think that, that this more fluid, struggled over form of dialectical, earthly form as well, mediated through material processes, mediated in relation to the non-human, that is Gramsci's dialectical approach and it is consistent with a kind of dialectics which is not just back and forth it is the rhythms as he says right kind of attention to flux there's some work in Gramscian studies on thinking about what distinguishes Gramsci's dialectics but I think the earthly aspect of it is something that we need to think more about and I think that's consistent with Brathwaite. So in the current conjuncture, which is pretty dreadful with, you know, environmental degradation, climate change, geopolitical tensions, uh, where would uh, Gramsci take hope from the sea? To come back a little bit towards the end of the book where, you know, you bring his discussion, I mean, his, his letter with to, to his son. I'm just wondering a little bit, like, what can the ocean tell us about how we could live politically in a different way towards the planet, towards each other? I know it's a big question. <laughs> But he lived in the anti-war year, and so a big war came, and everybody is kind of afraid of the two big wars coming, uh, our war against the environment, and the environment kind of warring on us as a result, and, and also, you know, geopolitical wars. Yeah, it's a great question. It's interesting. Gramsci's approach to waves of struggle and counter-struggle, we live in a time when that's in a way generalized, and we think we're immune to it. That's actually a mistake. We are differently immunized from it. Well, the book, I think, doesn't t tell us you know, where to look, but it does maybe tell us how to think about conjunctures and different conjunctures, thinking with your own interests and your own work, your long interest in ocean defenders. And that's sort of one place to look at how in specific places, specific people, specific constellations have emerged in relation to particular oceanic issues. Here in Southern Africa, this you know, amazing uh, struggle in Ptolemy, in which the subsea emerges as a site of ritual and, and traditional... An ancestral lineage. Ancest ancestral lineage, ancestral home, yeah. and also place of refuge and dreams. And that becomes part of a legal struggle to defend the ocean from extraction. Amazing. That's a site in which cultural work is crucial, black cultural work is crucial, and mobilized in an exciting political way with hope. Of course, we need a world of this. We need a planet of ocean defenders. That's beautiful. What a way to end. Thank you. Well, the three of you could uh, answer anything that you've asked much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it very much. Thanks a lot. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yes. This has been a University of Minnesota Press production. The book Gramsci at Sea is available from University of Minnesota Press. An open access edition is available at manifold.umn.edu. Thank you for listening.